Oh, yeah, my name is Shavi. I'm, I'm one of the obstetrician gynaecologists at Monash Health. I'm, I'm also the Director of Curriculum and Assessment for Women's Health Students at Monash University. I do private obstetrics and gynaecology both. I'm a generalist and I work privately at Cabrini, um, Jesse Mack and Waverley Private Hospitals. In addition, I do some research on the side with um, Bachelor of Medical Science students. I have a young family. I've got two young children, a three and a half year old daughter and a 10 month old son. Okay, so, um, so when I was in third year medical school, I actually wanted to do neurology. So I just like the idea how something happens here, something happens over here and it makes sense. So if I had done my BMED Sci after third year, I would have done it in neurology. But when I'd got into medical school, one of the things I was most interested in was paediatrics. And so I thought, well, that happened in fourth year, so I thought maybe I'll wait until fourth year and see how that goes. And if I like paediatrics, then maybe I'll just do paediatrics. So I did my fourth year and then I did my paediatrics rotation and hated it. Um, but then I did my ONG rotation, which I had never even thought of before as being a potential career pathway, um, and I really loved it. And so I decided to do a BMSI in ONG after my fourth year. So I did that, did well with that, and then I was still interested in neurology, but not, not as interested, but I just wanted to rule it out. So in my final year, I did a rotation in women's health, and then I also did a rotation in neurology. I did really well in neurology. I won the neurology prize in my final year, but still every time I went into neurology, I still kept being drawn back into women's health. And so um, by the time I was an intern, I was sure that I wanted to do ONG. And then uh, I applied. This was now about, two, about almost 10 years ago now, or more than just over 10 years ago now. I applied to do ONG training when I was an intern and I got accepted as an in intern started the started as a level one ONG trainee as a PGY2. So then the ONG training program is structured as a six year program with four years of core training and two years of advanced training. But that's how it was back then. It's basically the same now. And so I did my four years of core training. Um, during that time, I sat the exams, the specialty exams, which is a written exam, which is a three hour MCQ and a three hour short answer question exam. And then an oral exam, which was basically a whole morning um, worth of OSCEs. Uh, and they're actually structured very similar to the medical student OSCEs. And then so past those, well, at my year five mark, I decided to do a PhD. So I started my PhD in my level six year, so my final year, and, and I counted a year of my research towards my training program. So that meant that I did five years of clinical ONG, one year of research, and that still made me a specialist. So one year into my PhD, I had uh, my fellowship letters, so I could start practicing or locuming as a consultant. Then I uh, started the job, so then I continued my PhD, finishing that, and during that process, that time I started getting more involved with the medical students, doing a lot of teaching with the students. And then early last year, so this was about a year after I finished my PhD, I started in the role managing the curriculum and the exams for the students. Yeah, so right now I'm doing balancing quite a lot of things, which is which is challenging but also keeps me busy. I think the, probably the bulk of my time is spent with my private practice now. So private obstetrics and then private gynecology as well, which I'm starting to cut back now just because it's getting a bit too busy. So I'm doing mostly private obstetrics. Then I'm doing the public work at Monash Medical Center in Clayton. And that is about on average about a day a week. Then the medical students role, which involves adjusting and adding and removing things from the curriculum as well as coordinating the exam writing and exam content. So that's about two days a week. Then on top of that, I'll do some research. So I'm supervising a BMED size student at the moment and next year I'll be doing the same. And finally, my family. So balancing that, all that with family, my children and my wife. So that's, they're all of the things I think I'm doing at the moment, yeah. yeah. 
I think the best part of the job is the job satisfaction, I think is probably the best part. So I think in a lot of areas in medicine, you feel pretty good when you go home, but in women's health, it's regular that I'll come home and I'll feel like I've done something very good at work. I really enjoy coming to work and I really enjoy delivering a baby. It just, it makes it feel like everything that you're, you've done is worthwhile. So it makes it feel like you go home and it could have been the worst day. You might've been up for 18 hours of the day, but still you feel really, really good that you've done something that's helped someone and something that's happy as well, which is nice. And there's a lot of gratitude in, in, in obstetrics. A lot of women come in, they say thank you. And that's really nice too. And I think that just helps to, it helps when you get woken up at two in the morning regularly, because it just means that you, you're recognized for what you're doing. I think the worst thing about the job is probably the unpredictability. So I don't think the hours are particularly bad and you can control your hours to an extent, but the unpredictability is hard. So for example, I don't mind getting woken up at two in the morning as long as I know I'm going to get woken up at two in the morning. Or I don't mind getting called for a birth um, if I know I'm, I've got a birth there. But with, with labour, with obstetrics, you never know when a, when a lady is going to go into labour. That's hard, mainly, mainly, I think if I was a single person without any other responsibilities and all I did was private obstetrics, it would be easy. Like it would be totally easy. The hard thing is, you know, if I've got, to, if I've got to go to a wedding or if it's my anniversary dinner or if it's my daughter's birthday, I have to schedule time to try to make it. So to try to leave work or have someone cover me for that period of time so that I can do it, um, which is fine, so you can do that, but in obstetrics it's hard too because you get, you get to know the patients really well, the patients get to know you really well, and you really want to be there for their birth. They want you to be there for the birth, and you want to be there too. So when you have to get someone to cover you, you always feel a little bit guilty towards the patient. The patient's paying you as well, but even that is not, not really all of it. Uh, for example, last week I, um, I had a patient, I went away for the weekend with my family, um, we went uh, camping for the weekend and then, uh, and I, before that I told my patients that I was going to be away and there was one patient who was due around then and I'd also arranged to see a movie with my daughter, so to take my daughter to see a movie the day after I got back from the camping trip. So halfway through the camping trip I got a call from the hospital saying that she had ruptured her, she'd broken her waters but she wasn't in labour yet. It was the second baby, wasn't in labour yet. And I said, oh, that's good, okay, we we're okay. So I got home, uh, we got back, and she still wasn't in labour, so I thought, okay, that's good. And so I told the patient that I was gonna go see the movie with my daughter the following morning as well. And we were halfway in the movie, and she came in and had a baby at the hospital. So I had someone covering for me, and fortunately she already knew that obstetrician as well, so that helped. But, uh, but it was, literally the two hour period we were in the movie that she came in had the baby and I missed it and she was very good about it she was very happy about it but I still feel like you know it's a shame so that's that's hard I suspect that as I get more senior maybe I won't care as much but I hope I never get to that point the fact that I care about that as much as I do probably makes a difference to how I practice as well and patients see that but that's I think the hardest thing is the is the unpredictability So, so I think that um, with ONG, if you want to do ONG and you're pretty sure you want, I think the first thing you have to be is pretty sure. So you need to know that you want to do it. Just like any specialty in medicine, if you don't really want to do it, you won't do it well. You need to, you need to feel like you won't mind the worst thing about the job. So if you're happy with the worst thing about the job, it doesn't matter what specialty, then that's probably a good specialty to think about. If you're thinking about doing ONG, getting into the training program is probably your first goal but after that after your in ONG after that you need to start thinking much longer term so you need to be thinking about being a good obstetrician not passing your exams or getting through the surviving the training program you should be thinking about the end game the how to be a good obstetrician good doctor but to help you get onto the training program the sorts of things that you could do are things that basically will then also prepare you well for being a good obstetrician. Things like research, but it should be good research, not just fast, get my name on a paper sort of research. It should be proper research. 
You should feel like you want to do research if you're going to do it. You shouldn't just do it just to get on the training program. I think we're finding a lot more people are trying to do that now and we notice that. And we don't pay attention to those those students as much as we do for the ones who seem to really get it, really get research. And, and those tend to be the students who take it to another level, BMSI, Masters, PhD. Um, so those students tend to be the ones that we remember, not the ones who come in and do a 10, like a 10 week project and then leave, uh, get their name on a paper and then leave. So, so research is one thing you can do, but not the only thing. I think aid work, volunteer work, overseas work, even things that are not really rele relevant to medicine, but set you apart on paper. So, I mean, we've got a lot of talented people in, your, in, in, in the Monash Medical course. I mean, right now, one of my students is a, uh, was a national champion pole vaulter. And previously, we've had, I've had a student who was the top weight lifter in New, New Zealand. So those sorts of things are the sorts of things that just make you stand out. And it's not, not just because you're a top weight lifter, but to be a top weight lifter, you have to have certain characteristics. So in ONG, like with any other specialty, those sorts of extra things are rewarded. If uh, I'll give you another example, I was reviewing resident applications for the, the unaccredited HMO job at Monash recently. And I had one student who came in who had a PhD, who published three papers, who'd, um, so this is a, not student, sorry, an intern, published three papers. And, and then another, another candidate who came through and she'd, she'd been a, an intern at, at a hospital, but not really done anything extra. And when you, when you look at those two on paper, there's absolutely no comparison. So the first, the first guy got an interview and probably will get the job. The, the second, second candidate, I couldn't interview her because there was just too many people applying who had something more. So that is what you need to set you apart when you go into a training program, any job really. It's not impossible to do. Uh, that's another thing. So a lot of people think, oh, it's too hard. So I don't think that I don't think you should not do something because you think it's too hard. Uh, that's the wrong motivation. You should not do something if you don't want to do it. But if you really like it and really want to do it, then it doesn't matter how hard it is. So if you want to do neurosurgery, even though apparently that's the hardest one, I think that's, but if you want to do neurosurgery and you really want to do it, just do it. Get, do whatever you can to get in. The other thing you have to be really careful about in any specialty training program is that people have to like you. So if you are not able to to do all this without you know, being mean to other people, lying, uh, cheating. If you can't do it without doing that, then you're not going to get very far. So you might get into the program, you might even finish the program, but afterwards you won't become successful if you're like that. So you think it's um, common sense, but you'd be amazed at how few people actually recognize that. And you see it in the, in the hospital system too. You'll see there'll be, there'll be specialists that nobody really refers to, nobody really wants to go to. When the patient comes in and the patient says to the midwives, or the midwife says, who's your obstetrician? And the patient says, oh, it's this person. The, patient, the, the midwife says, oh, oh, okay. You don't want that. You want the midwife to say, oh, you know, that, that obstetrician is really nice. Oh, you're really lucky that you're seeing them. So that comes from the ability of just being a nice person. So if you're not a nice person, it doesn't matter how smart you are, you will get you know, to, an ex to a point, but you can't really get very far. But similarly, if you're just a nice person and you're not good at anything, then you're not going to get very far either. Yeah?